Good evening and thank you for staying with Metropole TV. When we sit down, it's time for the conversation. But before we jump straight into it, you can watch us on Facebook and on YouTube using our handle at Metropole TV KE. My guests are already in studio and we are ready to have our conversation. Thank you, gentlemen and lady, for making time. Ken and Nerima Wako, thank you for making time. Thanks. I am looking forward to a very interesting conversation mm -hmm. because politics in Kenya is something so dear to our heart, yet it's a very volatile space, okay? Because Kenyans live, eat, and breathe politics. But since 1963 to 2019, what can we say so far politics has done for us? Nelly, Nerima. Mm -hmm. That's such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first question. Yeah. No, I mean, like, you <laughs> are you <laughs> in, in that space. Yeah, I am in that space. Yeah. And, and I like the fact that you started off by saying that Kenyans, we live, we breathe, we eat politics. And that's why the organization where I work is called Siasa Place. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing is when we came up with the name, it was actually rejected. Mm -hmm. And we were told, well, this is not a political party. You should register the Political Parties Act. But what I'm trying to say is um, it is true that we are very political. And it's funny how we do not necessarily admit that. But when we talk about our politics in our country, we have seen transitions. And I don't know if I would say that we are democratic. As much as International Democracy Day just passed, um, I would say no considering that we say we have one of the most progressive constitutions, mm -hmm. I do think that we were in a time where we were heading somewhere in the 60s. And we had very futuristic leaders. Then something just went array. Mm -hmm. And I would say that right now, if we look at even civil society, because when you talk about politics, you cannot talk about politics just with politicians. It's also civil society organizations. It's also movements and processes. And right now, if we even talk about the church, we don't even consider the church a strong opinion. Mm -hmm. We have politicians fighting in church, and we're wondering why we're allowing uh, church leaders to yeah. have those political debates. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that, in a sense, as much as now we have a constitution, in a way, we've also gone backwards mm -hmm. in terms of following processes or implementation of that constitution and whether we are all equal. Because mm -hmm. as much as chapter one talks about we the people having the sovereign power, I don't think the people have that sovereign power. Where does the discord come in, Ken? Because politics, just like she said, in the 60s we looked like we were on the right track with Mzee Jomo Kenyatta saying we have three things that we want to focus on. Maliza Ujinga, Ugonjo and Umaskini. Fast forward 2019, his son, still the president, Focusing on those things, just that he's made them for and he's listed them in English. Yeah. Uh, I think, first of all, I think we've had a good track record. Mm -hmm. We've done well compared to other countries in the region in terms of economy. Uh, economy is directly related to uh, politics. Uh, in terms of security as well, I think we've, we've been stable. Mm -hmm. we've been, we're considered a stable country in the region. Uh, in terms of development, we, we have devolution. Uh, we have superhighway. We have the train, stuff like that. Uh, but yes, that situations where I feel we've been let down, mm -hmm. uh, we do not have strong, strong laws that actually punish people who go wayward in terms of corruption. Are we, are we short of laws though? Merima is nodding and <laughs> saying no. <laughs> we have three governors who have cases at the moment and they're still serving. So the issue is, <laughs> in my view, implementation. I think the principle is there. Uh, but we don't live by that principle, mm -hmm. in my view. And, and speaking of leadership that is being inducted in corruption allegations, either way we'll stand by the innocent until proven guilty, right? However, what, what informs the breed of leadership that we put in office? Hmm. I think it's, it's a mixture of several things. Um, it's not a lack of information. People know a good leader. I believe so. Um, because we identify good leaders in our communities. Mm -hmm. And somehow, when it comes to politics, there's a disconnect mm -hmm. where people are more concerned about the handout and how much they received. And politicians are so keen on being the last one to give the most yeah. so that people remember this is the person that I owe my vote to. So when we get to the voting box, we don't necessarily think, hmm, let me think of a good character to represent me we look at maybe who was the last one to bribe me, or it would be suit, 
who is my family voting for, which party does my family align to, and, and that's what I'm going to go with. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that we do not necessarily think, and that's the most important time to think. Well, Kenyans can think for five years, and on that one day, <laughs> well, I don't know where the brain goes to, but Ken, your two cents. Uh, I think... Until we change the circumstances of that guy whose vote is swayed by 50 shillings, a bag of unga, until we change the circumstances of that person, mm -hmm. we will always end up with leaders who are not living up to standard. However, why are we very short-sighted? How come 50 shillings can influence a decision that will last with you for five years and even longer? Is it that Kenyans do not know what good leadership can do for them or we are just myopic as our leaders are? And I think... Uh, Recently, there was something that was going online. Uh, there's a story online. You've never been broke until you're in town and you don't have bus fare. So you can imagine this is someone who's probably not had a decent meal yeah. in a while. Mm -hmm. And here comes a politician who is promising, vote for me. Uh, I will prom I assure you, you'll always have this kind of food or this kind of handout uh, regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have it for that day and you're thinking, so if whoever is in power and he's given me this, probably he will sort me out in future. Yeah. So, and that's where probably the lie is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. I want to follow up with you, Nerima. Mm -hmm. He's come, he said, I'll do A, B, C, and D for you, right? I vote you mm -hmm. in. And typical to the scripts, only 1% or 2% follow up with that. Why do we still vote them back into office? Because even in the gubernatorial space, we're seeing second-term governors who their counties mm -hmm. are as good as they were in the first term. Mm -hmm. I do think we, we vote them back, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. I think that our government has some of the highest turnover rates, um, especially when you look at MCA position level. A lot of them serve for one term. And I think it's back to devolution, where we're just beginning to understand the roles of particular offices mm -hmm. and understanding the kind of promises that they make and can make and people are now using that as an accountability measure. Mm -hmm. That didn't exist before. So I'm not uh, particularly very gloom mm -hmm. on that aspect. I do think that people are observing yeah. and people are taking keen as to whether this particular individual is giving me any service in my community. So one step at a time, Kenyans are beginning to appreciate the value of good leadership and what it can do for them. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of Kenyans, we went out in the streets and we had a conversation with them because on debrief, it's always very important to bring that voice uh, onto the show. Like we said, when we began, this show is about you. And this season, we want you to be at the center of every conversation. So we went out in the streets and we were asking you, do you think celebrity politics can translate into good political leadership and governance or can celebrities make good political leaders and this is what you had to say from the streets of Nairobi listening Well, the magic of technology, technology has refused. In a minute, we'll go back to that video. But I want to go back to the conversation that we were having. And just before we bring in the people, I'd like to hear your views. In the 21st century, what do you think should be the qualities and characters that inform the kind of leaders that we put in office? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things we should vet and look at? The kind of leaders, I think because our employ unemployment rate is so high, it would be those who have agendas when it comes to the economy in mm -hmm. terms of finding opportunities for young people invested in that. I think that what's happening, and it's a global shift, we're seeing leaders being elected based on um, particular groupings. And unfortunately, that's the way the world is going. Where mm -hmm. We're seeing Brexit, we're seeing Trump right now hoping for a re-election and using fear to make sure that he moves with that. And so I think that there's a lot of, not even just classism, there's a lot of groupings. Mm -hmm. And I think a futuristic leader is one where pushes for unity and that would be going against the grain mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah. Ken, allow me to yes. bring you in here and you also have a little bit of business background. Nerima has spoken about unemployment and we've seen so many leaders use that. Uh, the, in season one I had uh, Caleb Amisi come into studio and he was saying he has a bill where he's proposing that graduates who do not have jobs be given a 3,000 monthly stipend as they try to survive. But that's just a short term. You know, but that's a leader trying to do all he can in his capacity. However, 
what more can governments do, particularly in terms of leadership, to solve the problems of the youth? Because look at a country like Estonia, a very small country, that is doing so much for its people. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in terms of what the government is doing for the youth and employment, there are some uh, proposed changes, especially in the Finance Bill 2019, uh, where now there was a fund that was supposed to be created to register young people, and I think uh, they would get either financing and supposed to finance uh, tech, you know, things mm -hmm. like that, yeah, so which is a good thing. Yes. Uh, there's also the National Employment Authority, mm -hmm. uh, which has been created uh, to... Uh, it's been created and one of its uh, mandates is actually to uh, register unemployed youth and also register opportunities that are in various uh, corporations or various institutions and once there's an opening mm -hmm. the youth registered with the authority will be given opportunities but I don't think that is enough because it's coming in late in the day we already have the numbers I saw you say 7 million yeah 7.4 million I think it's, it's a huge number so uh, in my view I feel the first challenge was you know, when funds that are meant to go to a certain project don't go to that project, mm -hmm. it means opportunities are not created. Yes. So uh, the youth can't get employed, mm -hmm. so they end up being jobless. Uh, if, for instance, a hospital is supposed to be built somewhere or a stadium or something and that was not built, uh, it becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, again, also the other thing that the government is doing, which I think is nice, is concentrating on TVET as opposed to uh, universities now. Because now we have a situation where we have a lot of graduates but you don't have guys to do manual work. Mm -hmm. yeah, so again, the government still needs to push that TVET agenda mm -hmm. further so that we have people who have the technical skills to actually do the job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And speaking of the youth, Nerima, the youth are beginning to take the matters into their own hands. They're trying to change their feet. And we've seen this through them trying to put a more youthful leadership in place. We, we saw in 2013 and even in 2017, people who did not have jobs, people who were just freshly graduates, but because they appealed to the youth with whatever they were trying to say they would do, they got into office. You know, it's not just a case of the United States, even in Kenya, we've seen it. Do you think this is creating a paradigm shift? Hmm. I don't think it's creating a, a paradigm shift. I don't. And reason being, mm -hmm that if we were to look at MCAs, MCAs, um, a number of them are below the age of 35, actually over 700. Mm -hmm. And if you think of that, you would think that there would be major changes when it came to youth, <laughs> but not so much. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we see reports of MCAs, they're either fighting or trying to kick out the governor or, you know, you understand? Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is even though we have a few young people in positions of power mm -hmm. or legislation, you still need to lobby. Mm -hmm. You still need a team. So you cannot really make major moves without having a core group. Mm -hmm. And not only that, that would mean not only a caucus, it would mean that you would also have to have a position that has influence. Yes. There are certain committees that you'd have to sit on. There are certain decisions that you'd have to be a part of. And it goes back to young people when you even look at certain committees that make very major public like budget decisions you will not find a youth representative sitting in that committee mm -hmm. and so it's about also being in a position of influence mm -hmm. and as much as you'd think like being a member of parliament gives you that it doesn't necessarily mean so mm -hmm. so there's still a lot of work and a lot of ladders to climb can i agree and disagree at the same time oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes i agree as in uh, i guess we need to have of more youth uh, in positions of power and so that they can influence uh, policies and decisions that uh, that would benefit the youth but again we have a challenge and this I guess is it's as a result of our conditioning because mm -hmm. we've seen previous generations get into power and benefit themselves yes. so right now you ask someone just randomly off the street uh, so if I was to give you this what would you do if you appoint me an MP of course I'll sort myself out you yeah. know as in I want to sort my situation so uh, it's my turn to eat it's my turn <laughs> to eat exactly you know so I think about so there's an opportunity here I have a friend who's back at home yes. so we can register a company and we can do this and supply this you know so that has been our conditioning that once you're in power it's your turn to eat and unfortunately also for the youth it's the same situation so you find these mcas they are elected and instead of representing youth affairs or pushing the youth agenda they benefit themselves yeah yeah and and and, and speaking of which oh you have a reason I do. <laughs> Go ahead. because if you enter with a political party yeah, yeah. 
how are you supposed to push for issues that are of your interest? You have to push your political party's interest, which many times is older men owning yeah, them. It's true. So it's difficult, again, back to what I was talking about, the hierarchy of power. Yeah. <laughs> you still have to pledge allegiance to who put you on the table. But yeah, there are those yeah. who have gone against the grain. They've suffered consequences here and yeah, there, yeah. but they've ended up being fine. They end up being fine, but they end up be being out of parties. I'm talking about David Ocheng. Yes. <laughs> Where he yeah. was left ODM and mm -hmm. now he has his own party, MDG. But and he entered as a young representative. But that's, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. We do not do, is it that we do not realize that the power lies with the people that put us in office and we pledge so much allegiance to the party and the political elite that we forget the whole purpose of leadership? Mm -hmm. And that's why I talked about with the people being the first sentence in our constitution and us not really living it. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we still view leadership as the final say. Yes. We live in a country where we are afraid of the government instead of the government being afraid of its own people. Mm -hmm. and, and now we are seeing even a new crop of leadership among the youth. And now we are putting faces and names and I do not understand the logic behind it but we're seeing celebrities being put there people who have no political background or haven't been politically uh, vocal before I was having a conversation with somebody today and they were telling me there's a popular socialite who says by 2022 she'll be vying for uh, women representative Nerima don't I'm laugh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to be serious. <laughs> you see just, it's it's just it's it. it's even funny that yeah. the kind of people that are coming up, what's informing this decision? Is it that why do we want celebrities in office and can they mm. translate to good political leaders? Ken, do you wanna go first? Yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the reason why people are pushing celebrities now is because they want to sell a face or at least push a face that is acceptable mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it's actually the celebrity who's running it's the either the party or the people who are pushing the celebrity okay. and I do not think uh, celebrities necessarily make good leaders mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to give Kenyan example but I can give an example let's say uh, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger in the in California mm -hmm. uh, he was he got in on a popular vote mm -hmm. by the time he was getting out uh, he was ranked amongst the l worst performing governors in in the u.s mm -hmm. so that's a situation where a uh, celebrity did not do well yeah uh, again president uh, reagan mm -hmm. in the states he was an actor before joining uh, politics he did fairly well uh, cascading down to our country i am yet to see a celebrity who's in political office who's done good Never mind. Mm -hmm. i mean i feel like um when when i okay so i wrote an article mm -hmm. And I said in Kenya, the only thing that we take so seriously where you'd compare the Oscars in the U.S. where you're actually watching celebrities is our politics, mm -hmm. uh, especially elections. And, and I say this because we, we confuse um, our politicians for celebrities. Yeah. Uh, where when you have our governor acting or behaving or looking like a celebrity, it's misconstrued. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we're one of the only countries where we talk so much about our politicians, they're actually celebrities. It's not even an actor, it's not even a singer, it's not even a socialite. And, and I think that there's, there's a even a more deeper issue in that. Mm -hmm. The fact that people view entering politics as an achievement and, and not necessarily doing it to serve people so yes. we've completely lost that mm -hmm. and so for me i would say that yeah I've, I've not really seen a celebrity doing well but also our politicians are celebrities yeah. yeah but if 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 we look at the case of nigeria uh was it some time back they had an election and banky w who's a very popular musician Oli Bankole wellington put himself forth and when you'd watch his interviews when you'd listen to his campaign you could see that there was something he was championing for, despite being a musician. Desmond Elliott has also been elected into politics. But these are celebrities who have found a voice for the people in politics. Is it that our Kenyan celebrities, our politicians being there too, are yet to find the reason why they want to be in politics and they're there for one reason or the other and not necessarily the right reason? I think also it's the way our politics is played. Um, we, we talk about, uh, there's an article written where 
political rallies are about banter and about insults and vendettas. Mm -hmm. We don't really talk about issues or ideologies. So where we talk about them is campaigns. Yeah. And then after the campaign is done, it's done. So I think also we, we need to understand how, how we view our politics. Politics in Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, it might have similarities, but then they are also completely different. Yes. We've also seen Nigerians stopping a senator from going to a hospital. We're mm. fixing this country. Yes, exactly. you know, Kenyans, Kenyans <laughs> are fixing the country on Twitter. Yes, Nigerians are fixing it so, on the ground. Yeah, so we cannot compare ourselves to Nigerians. They That's will want true. to see somebody serious. But do you, <laughs> do you, are we exhausted? Have we got into that place where we're like, if you're not serving us, celebrity or not, politician or not, we don't care, you're not serving us. You know, this is a saying, it's always dark before dawn. Mm -hmm. So you have to do what I'm in the trenches, being served poorly, for us to realize what good leadership is. But come to think of it, allow me to play devil's advocate. Since 1963, we've been in the dark. The president says do not compare Kenya to Singapore, Malaysia, and Japan. We will not do that. However, in 1982, India decided they set their big five and to date India is one of the top medical destinations in the world. Kenyans are going to India yeah. to get medical treatment. 70 years ago China decided to open up their country. 40 years ago they decided they will embark on an infrastructural development project across the whole of China. To date China is one of the most infrastructurally developed countries. So don't you think we've been in the dark long enough? Uh, yes, I, I totally agree. And I think part of the reason why uh, or where we lost the race is we neglected manufacturing. Yes. Because we no longer manufacture. Mm -hmm. The countries you've mentioned, they've got strong manufacturing industries. I don't think a country or I don't think a, yeah, I don't think a country can grow to extent where these countries have reached without yes. manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, we neglected our industries, textile, everything we neglected. Mm -hmm. We uh, preferred trading commodities, you know, as opposed to manufacturing. I, I feel, plus, again, politics and corruption and everything. That's what contributed to us losing the race. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're getting to a point where we have 7 million youth who are unemployed. That number is most likely rise. As mm -hmm. in, this year, official jobs created was 17,000, down from 114. So it means, yes, we're actually getting to that point where the buck will break. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nerima, do you think we should take the responsibility of deciding what you want to do for this nation from the leaders and say we as Kenyans, we as County XYZ, we're putting you in office, but this is what you're going to do for us. I think, I think it's about time uh, because there was a time when members of parliament were trying to increase their salary, right? And they're still trying. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, they're always trying. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know what just, just, just ticked me was how now they moved to housing allowance and then to a night allowance and then they had another one the one for eating yeah so it just shows you how our, our leadership is just like you know what we just we don't care and we're openly showing you that we don't <laughs> care, care. Yeah. and so it does get to a point where as a kenyan citizen we cannot live in that bubble anymore mm -hmm. of you know things are so bad ah, they're so bad now what can i do like we cannot keep having that response and being more engaged with what happens even through as low as our wards mm -hmm. because a lot of us don't know unfortunately and it's not our fault because in a sense civic education has not been done you yeah. know when it comes to our constitution mm -hmm. and in a sense the president announced that we've been overly educated we know enough in fact, they cut funding when it came to civil society organizations that do that work. So it, it just shows you that there are challenges. And so it takes a lot more effort, but it needs to be a conversation that's had not only at home, but even in our places of worship. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just before I bring you Ken in, uh, in a minute we'll be bringing in a video by Abina Masena as we almost come to a close of this conversation on why it's very important for you to take note of the kind of leadership that we're putting in office. But now, your two cents. All right. Uh, I tend to think one thing, Punguza uh, Mzigo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So probably guys should listen more about mm -hmm. and just learn more about what it provides. Uh, I think it's... I, uh, the ideology behind it is good. Okay. I don't know if it's sellable to everyone, but I think it's, it's a good idea. But yes, there's a mechanism of uh, recalling your MP, for yes. instance. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. there in the law. But uh, it's very difficult again. Mm -hmm. as in, I mean, you can, uh, we've seen MPs who've been 
implicated in uh, criminal activities, even corruption, but they're still in, in office. And one of the reasons... Who all puts them in office, though? Anyone. <laughs> and we even know people in office who were made by corruption scandals. We don't want to mention names. We don't want any legal battles with anyone. Yeah. But if you are found in a corruption allegation right now, Ken, the probability of you being a member of parliament, an MC or a governor in your county are very high. Yeah, it's true. Uh, but what the law provides is that... Uh, you have to have been convicted by a court of law for you, for the constituents to recall their MP. So you see, that threshold is high. And again, our court system moves a bit slowly. So you find by the time a case is conclusively decided until appeal stage, it may take 10 years. This MP has already served two terms. You see, that again is, becomes a challenge. So probably we need to relook at how that law has been drafted and mm -hmm. see how we can make it more practical. Nerima, what, what should be the Kenyan threshold? We can talk about what threshold we hold leaders at, but we as Kenyans, what threshold should we hold ourselves at? I think um, integrity, yeah. really, because we talk about corruption being an issue all the time, but then we, we visibly see it all the time, and so that's something that we can act on individually. And I actually think that um, Katiba Institute challenged that, the recall. And right now, there's actually a, a, a gap because they, re they removed that part on it having to go through courts. Yes. So there's actually an opportunity. There's a window because people can recall. It's a little bit vague. And so I, I don't know why um, some people haven't tried. Yeah. But again, you know, people can say, anyway, it's just five years, as they always say. 2022 <laughs> is coming, we'll vote you out of office. Bina Masena is about to tell you why those five years really matter. Listen in. It's our turn to make the right political decisions, not just for ourselves, but for the future generation. You put a bad leader in office today, five years down the line, you've put a celebrity, they've put on a good show for you, games and gimmicks as we like, they're fighting in parliament, they're always on Facebook, they're shaming deadbeat dads and stuff like that, and we're entertained. But that's five years we've lost, and then 50 years down the line, our kids will be told Kenya and Rwanda were at the same place. It will no longer be Singapore. It will be Rwanda, Ethiopia, yeah. and Ghana. Okay. That's true. As in today, uh, I was privileged to attend a meeting where some people were discussing attracting financing to the country. Yes. And uh, one guy actually said that we're losing the battle to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethiopia recently gave concessions to different industries, yeah? And guys were setting up industries. I think there was uh, an aviation... Uh, companies in the aviation industry, motor vehicle assembly industry, they preferred setting up shop in, in Ethiopia. They bypassed Kenya, went to Ethiopia. Uh, recently, it's also a Pan-African bank bypassed Kenya, went and decided to set up its headquarters in Uganda. So it's true. If we do not get our act together, definitely we will lose out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And getting our act together involves electing the right leaders. Nerima? I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree with Ken. Nothing to be added. It's it's <laughs> spot on. Well, do we have the video of uh, Kenyans on the streets uh, sharing their thoughts? Okay, not yet. So we want to take a short breather as we try and put that video together because it's very important that we bring your voice into this conversation. And during that breather, when we come back also, we'll be on social watch. So it will equally be a good place for the video to air because that's always the place that my mic goes off and your voice comes on. We'll see you shortly.